Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero, and today we publish our 400th episode. What great fun it's been meeting many of our favorite top performers in such a wide variety of fields. And I really have Pete to thank, since he works tirelessly to keep up the volume while I develop a new show. And of course, Scott Husing, who at first was a guest on the show as one of those favorite top performers and has become a regular and fantastic co-host. Now, to put 400 episodes into context, consider that the average lifespan of a podcast is a whopping seven episodes. Seven. Of course, Adam Carolla is deep into the thousands, and so is Joe Rogan, but I have to look at TV to find comparisons of shows that went into and beyond 400. So, Law & Order had 456, Ozzy and Harriet had 435, Bonanza had 431. We'll catch those by spring. The Simpsons is the longest-running TV show in history, approaching 700 episodes and still going strong. But the king of longevity in radio broadcasting is Oscar Brand. His show, Folk Song Festival, ran in Canada for 70 years and 291 days. The first broadcast aired on December 9, 1945, and it ran continuously every week until its final broadcast on September 24, 2016, just before Oscar Brand passed away. So thanks for going on this ride with us. Thanks for commenting on the show to help us make it better. And I hope you keep enjoying it. Here's number 400. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Cooper. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner, co-host of the Break It Down (laughs) show and also Album Fights and also Popping the Bubble and producer of a number of other podcasts. And you're listening to the Break It Down show. And now, The Break It Down Show, with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, we are. We're on The Break It Down Show, and I'm Scott Husing, the host, thanks to Pete Turner, which is his (laughs) show. I love co-hosting with Pete, but we are doing episode 400. Celebrating a lot of things. Also, about a year ago, we met, and it's also been your birthday. Yes, And my birthday's on the horizon, so. Yeah, it's, a lot. It is a, it is a lot, and as we were just talking about, it seems like it's been much longer that we've known each other because we've covered so much ground. Yeah, we've met so many new people this it's year. It's it's been it's really been a phenomenal year, and to capture some of those things, and we'll talk about that in the show. I think is you know what what we've gained through our relationship and others and people coming in and out of our lives, and uh, it's just a really remarkable thing and. It, I think people have listened to me, they've listened to you about how important it is to share great stories. And that's what I love about you, man, is you're such a, you're not only a phenomenal storyteller and interviewer to get people to share so much of themselves, but you're such a, just a great kind person, man. I I love, I love telling the airport story. You picking me up. (laughs) Have I shared that on air before? Uh, I think you have. I I think I have too, but like you're the only guy that's ever thanked me for allowing you to pick me up from the airport. No one does that, but Pete Turner. (laughs) Well, it keeps me, it keeps me feeling like I'm contributing in some way, you know, because it's easy to get hard on all of ourselves in general. And I'm hard on myself like everybody else, you know, I, I'm not doing enough. I haven't given enough back. I don't make enough money. You know, I don't, don't, don't. But it turns out, like, when you when you slow down and you look back, that's why I love doing these kinds of shows. Like, I don't mind, like, like 400. Okay, great. Didn't we just do the 200? Yeah, we did. But we've been working hard this whole year, and it's important to look back and go, PR companies call me and say, we got so-and-so on the line. Can you have them on the show? You know, just that, that metric alone is such a big thing and a big accomplishment. It's easy to blow by that and not realize all of the things that we've done. You, you wrote a book. That's old news. You went out on the road and you sold the hell out of a book everywhere, all over the place, always on the air talking about it. That is an enormous endeavor. So I like to try to think about the things that I do and I like I like when I, you know, plenty of people say, you said something to me one time and I think, oh shit, you know, 
What did I, I hope? I hope it wasn't dumb. But then it ends up being a good thing because I try to be true to myself, and I'm glad that uh, that's a good mark. You know, it's the compliment's great, but just for me internally, like I'm doing the things that I want to do. I do want to be kind. I do want to try to reduce my amount of judgment. I want to be hard to offend. I don't want to offend people. And I think if I do those things, you know, I'm contributing, and and I like that. So, what is the one thing over? 399 episodes uh-huh. for a personal characteristic, something you think you were bad at before that you've really evolved and gotten better at now. Um, I think what I'm better at now, I'm a lot better at, boy, there's so many things. But I, I think once the show went to four times a week, um, that was a big commitment. And I've gotten better at that. And I think that not only do I think I can put out a lot of content and that's a marketable trait, but other people are seeing that now and saying, whoa, whoa, here's a guy who, you know, it's great to want to do a podcast, but it's a lot of work. I mean, just look at how much planning I do. You see, you see a, probably a third of the planning that I do, you know, and all the emails and all the emails that don't come back, you know, it's a load of work. So I think I, that that is a good thing that I've developed is the ability to say, without a doubt, to anybody in the marketplace, you may want to do a podcast, but if you need to get it out the door, I'm the guy that can do it. That That is something that's extremely challenging and also demanding on your time. I think that I, in a recent interview we did with Ryan Weaver, he, yeah. made a, he used a great analogy is, hey, that one picture on Instagram that you see, there was nine hours that went into that one picture oh and every 50 minute episode of the break yeah. it down show or popping the bubble that you listen to and you enjoy yeah. on this channel, there's hours and hours. I think it's a basic analogy of, I liken it to being an instructor for every one hour of instruction. Yeah. There's at least three hours of prep that a teacher uses to make sure that the students or in your case, the listener really get the most out of. Yeah. Yeah, because you think about the things that are invisible costs, like I've been watching these Dan Rather interviews, because I'm always trying to figure out what a good interviewer, I can tell you who they are and who I enjoy, but why, what skills, what what tools are they using, and then how do I, how do I apply them, or how do I go, oh, I'm leaving those tools alone, that's just not my strength, you know, just think about that, like getting better, or processing all the, you know, yes, we don't have a singular theme because we illustrate life, but taking all those perspectives and then turning them into thoughts that are coherent and go, this is how these things jump across all these disciplines. That all takes time. That's all part of that whole coast hosting and, uh, and illustrating thing that we have to do to make the show matter. So every podcast or every broadcast for that matter does have a theme. I think whether it's political self-help, how to do it. Yeah. What's Pete Turner's theme for the Break It Down show? I, I just, I like to illustrate life, you know, things that are interesting to me and, and, and who's defined by one thing, you know? If Joe Rogan can have on whoever he wants, you know, how come he gets to do it and why, why can't I, you know? I'm, I'm not just a combat guy. I'm a spy. I'm not just that. I'm an academic guy. I'm also, you know, a, a former athlete when my body worked. I've got all these things. I'm a dad, you know. I'm someone's significant other. I'm, I'm a lot of things. I love that. that yeah. Yeah, I used that recently with a friend of mine, and we likened it to uh, going to the optometrist. You sit down in the chair, and he – puts the thing whatever that thing is up to your eyes and he switches the lenses he goes yeah. this one no or this one yeah not so much this but this so pete's like not so much a soldier as he is a spy yeah not so much a storyteller is a share of other people's stories right. or, you know so there's so many different levels so many different lenses yeah. that you know, flip up and down and I'm moving my hands in front of my eyes right now, like the thing in the optometrist's <laughs> office, but that's Pete, you know, yeah. and that is, uh, really, it, it is an acquired skill. So, yeah. you know, from episode one to 400, that that's, rem- that's remarkable to be able to do that, man. It's, it's just- incredible too. And you look at the pedigree of the people that we've had, whether they're known or not, it, there's there's real impactful people in that body of work that are contributing to our lives if we just listen to what they're doing and go, wow, I, I can use some of that. 
I mean, every episode has, has gems in it. Every single one. I don't think there's a single episode that I've listened to or that I've been fortunate to co-host with you where I don't take some small piece of that and then weave that into something I talk about or continue to share that story. I think there's so many second and third order effects of being in this, this type of entertainment field where you know, everything we're talking about now, and, and Pete and I talked about this before the show. We're like, hey, what are we going to talk about in episode yeah. 400? And we <laughs> thought, well, we're going to talk about these things. But yeah. really, we wanted to share with the listeners today just the the experiences and the impact that this type of profession and the the passion, again, for doing what you love yeah. and really making an impact on those around you, how that really is super fulfilling for anybody. And I think those are questions that are important, not only to us as veterans, uh, us me, being me and Pete, who are sitting here in yeah. my ranch again in Southern California, to as entertainers and artists to really try and communicate stories that are important to people, that are ent- entertaining to people, and giving them something that they can take away with and say, God, you know what? I, I can use that. And to anyone listening, anything we say, Nothing's original. You can use any of it, <laughs> yeah. uh, and you can quote any of it because that's the beauty of what we do is is to share those stories. And I think you you have more experience in in that area of doing interviews with so many diverse people. Sure. And you know, talk a little bit about the the diversity of of, of why you approach certain subjects to get on your show. What. What is that one thing or, or those things that say, I got to get that person? On yeah. Show? So this, this, when I'm looking at what I want to have on, I might go to Barnes and Nobles and look at the books on the tables and go, who in here? That's how we got Lynn Vincent. You know, it's like, oh, okay, great. Here's the USS Indianapolis. I love this story. It's so tragic. And, you know, I know we can probably get this person. Or someone talks about, so we just did, and the show hasn't even posted yet. We just did an interview in my hometown with a refinery we call Valero. And there's a lot of people that hate it because they hate big oil and where the hell big oil is. And they hate it because they quote unquote pollute. Okay. Well, that's great. But, but what are we talking about? Like, are you mad because you drive a car and you have petroleum products around you all the time and you feel bad for yourself? Or are you mad because you don't understand who they are? Or are they really this evil mustache twisting entity? Let's go find out. And then, the ability that I bring is that I can actually, and not all the time, but I can go and I can get that meeting because I'm not trying to get them. I'm trying to have a conversation so I can better understand who they are. And so when you look at the 400 shows, there's a lot of that where it's like, I don't need to talk to Andy Summers about being in the police. I need to talk to him about art and where he is and where he's pushing because he's so far ahead of everybody artistically. You're not supposed to always get him. So how do I, how do I bring him a little bit back? closer to the audience because he's doing what inspires him and he's he's a 70 something year old man who doesn't have to do anything he doesn't want to do and hasn't had to for decades so what inspires that guy so how do you balance the content on any show in in the in the realistic perspective of salacious cells and understanding that just like me as a writer, I have to write what I love to write. I have to write about what you know people want to hear. Right. And there's this industry term that a lot of people don't talk about. It's called the give a shit factor. So you know, where do you balance that as far as well? I'm going to get this guy on. I'm going to ask him these questions because it's going to really generate a lot of interest, or it's going to be controversial. Because I, I don't really look back at any of the shows you've done and think, oh, it was super political, it was super controversial. And, you know, that's a balance. And some people really cross the line and they say, well, I'm going to talk about the blood and guts and the glory and sure. this and the, the scandal because that's what mainstream media, that's what social media, they eat that stuff alive, man. How, I mean, how do you... Is that just like your moral compass? I mean, it's my moral compass. It's, it's part of my, yeah, I always want to improve my character and I'm definitely trying to collect wisdom because heck, you know, I'm not getting faster and, and more like live in my body. I've got to build my brain and my character, you know? And so I definitely look for those things that are, 
not as easy because you know as well as I do that tension, the the friction that you talk about. These things are the things that like Mark Patterson walks up mountains to get his clarity, to yeah. keep himself focused. So how do you stretch yourself? And it's you 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 put yourself in front of someone who you don't like these cosmologists that we've been talking to. I don't know anything about cosmology compared to them. Like the gap is enormous. I know about some terms, but that forces me one to spend time in the literature, but two to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And I talk about miscomfort a lot. It's not that you're uncomfortable. It's just, you're not familiar with discomfort. And so the more I can do that, the more I can relate to people because the big people, the big thing that we all struggle with is for, we're all bigots. We all are intolerant towards something or someone or some, it, you know, and don't tell me your form of bigotry is better than mine. If the evolved person goes, I'm a bigot. I know my first response is likely to be wrong and I have to be fallible enough to go. I'm probably an asshole when I think this, let me slow down. And so let me give you an example, like Shaka Sungur. Who we're, he's been on the show in the past, but he's also we're working on this prison chronicle thing, and we were talking, and it's stuck with me. He's did a lot of time in prison, murdered somebody, and, and he brought all this wisdom out of prison. So okay, I want that. I I want to grab that. And he said, every person is rehabilitatable. Mm-hmm. That's where you set your watch right there, and then you fail. You fail every now and then to get that person right, and who knows why? Because it's hard work and it's multivariate. But if you start there as saying every person is redeemable, now you can spit the bit and go, what about Charles Manson? And he sees what he, I said, I'm, I need to ask you this because it's the obvious question. What about Charles Manson? He's an evil murderer who went around. He's like, how many people did he kill in the last 40 years in his life? None. None. All right. Do you think he was a better person or a worse person? I'm like, okay, you're right. So you're forced to reckon with that kind of wisdom. And you don't have to agree, but then he drops this on you. I'm from Detroit. This is, this is him talking. I'm from Detroit. Prison is an extension of my community. Hmm. You want to fucking step into those shoes and speak for him? You, how dare you? You can't. Nobody can. I can't speak for you. I can't speak for anybody else. My job is to do a whole lot more shutting up and understanding that I haven't walked your walk. I haven't walked yeah. his walk. Prison's extension of your community. Yeah, Fuck. it's absolutely something we create as a society. The public, yeah. again, doesn't want to recognize. And in, in, for the listeners, again, I'm going to give the award for the deep question or maybe the deep answer to Pete on this episode <laughs> because we have a running game of who gets the prize for the deep <laughs> academic question. But that was some philosophical shit, man. And it, it, it you know what? What's really interesting about that that statement is that the voice, who who's going to be the voice for this group? Who's going to be the voice for that? Right. And a lot of people are really intimidated by that, I think. And I'll share a personal story with me um, about the Veterans Day article that I just wrote yeah. in USA Today called, you know, Thank You for Killing. Man, it really set some people off. And I got some great responses back. But I also got some even from our own community right. saying that I work in this field, I work in this branch of the government, and I talked to some of the contemporaries about your article, and someone said, well, Scott is not doesn't speak for me as a veteran. Scott doesn't speak for me as a Marine. And I responded back all, with every ounce of resistance that I could, but I had to respond back because I normally don't feed into the poison. But this wasn't poison. This was a really well-put question. It was very cordial. It was respectful. I think it was probably an active guy put the R slash S, like respectfully submitted. Yeah. And uh, I, I said, you know what? I never suppose or assume that I am the voice of the veteran community. I'm yeah. not. I never I never say that I am standing on some pulpit saying I speak for all veterans. I'm just a guy that l- likes to share stories and I share my opinions. And that's what they are is opinions. And when it's called an op-ed, uh-huh. it's an opinion <laughs> editorial, yeah. meaning I write it, it's based on my opinion, some guy chops on it or girl and they they publish it. 
But again, that in and of itself, just like whatever you say or whatever guests you have on the show and you ask them these these pointed questions, the responses you get don't necessarily have to be things you agree with. Yeah. But you have to be that type of person that can really put it in perspective and understand that we're, you know, the, the human dynamic is so diverse that as you get older and you gain this wisdom and experience, which is one of the great things I love about your shows, yeah. is that you balance that and understand that you you become a better person by understanding that and allowing those perspectives. But that story that I just told was just one example that I, I wanted to reiterate, I think, for my own selfish purposes, if nothing else, to say that yeah, I don't ever say I'm I'm some prophet like for the veteran community or get up here and speak. But I feel that if I don't do it, who will? Yeah. yeah. You have to have that capacity to to hit the enter button on your computer yeah. and send that out into the ionosphere and send it out into the airwaves or whatever the medium is that you communicate your message. That takes courage. It does. Just like standing on a stage on Broadway and yeah. exposing yourself, trying to pretend to be something you're not. We're so much different because we're sharing a bit of ourselves and we're also helping people share a little bit more of themselves. So how how do you get people as an interviewer to share more of themselves based off of the research you've done of other great interviewers? So... A lot of this stuff is based on my own tools that I've developed from talking to thousands of people in conflict zones. You know, they they don't have to give me anything. They can absolutely tell me the same thing they always say, and I'll likely leave. But that's not my job. My job is to find out what the commander doesn't know he doesn't know. You know, like there's a whole list of questions. I always talk about this. There's, there's 100 questions that I could answer at any point in time that may or may not be the right answer. Who knows? And that stuff's important. But what really matters is when I come back to the commander and say, you're putting these efforts forward and here are the outcomes that I can find, right? So to do that, you have to listen to the person's answer and then say, that's all surface truth, first thought, pre-programmed, kind of like their mantra, what they would always say to whatever that question is. If you can take that person and encourage them to and I try not to manipulate, but when I was younger, that was the tool I had was manipulation. But like we talked to Robin. So Drake. what's manipulation though? So people can understand like <clears throat> I give, would, an, give an example yeah. of manipulating so someone. Manipul I, I would take control of the conversation with the right kind of questions to get control. Like I would ask a closed question. Is this, this or that? Yes or no. You know, and, and it's a lot more, it's a lot more, it works, but it's, um, it's harder to get that person to relax and drop their barriers if you're controlling something, obviously, you know, like if someone asks me, like if someone's in a political argument with me and they ask me a close question, I'm like, that's a close question. What are you trying to control? Where are you trying to go? You know, so so if, I've, if I'm thinking that I have to assume the person I'm talking to will think the same thing. So I just take them and I, I take them out of their linear timeline, kind of bouncing across the surface of the lake. And I say, go back to this you said this tell me more about that now they have to dive down deep and then once we're diving down deep then i can take them left or right in that depth or three-dimensionally and say give me an example of that give me an example when that didn't work give me an example from your neighbor you know and i can look mm. for these things where now they're really they're no longer on the surface they're pulling deep from their memory and i'm asking them about their opinion on things and that gets them to release a lot of that uh i'm already in the door basically i'm inside the house and i'm i'm kind of looking around and i'm asking them questions about things they want to answer hey tell me about your your flag up there what is that like you 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 have no ability except for to say oh that's the gunner from the company that commanded and I was in Ramadi. let me tell you about it you you have to there's a whole litany of things that I can take and use in there and I'm no longer on the surface of your brain I'm I'm deep into it. So as you've evolved and gotten more experience and more wisdom how do you take those from those close questions to something deeper? I look at for I'm, I I try to look for and I learned some of this from Mark Valley. I try to look for emotional cues. You know, what were, what were you thinking or what did I think they were thinking? And I try to put the question in an emotional frame. You know, like I, would, I talk, we're talking to um, uh, Jimmy Fitz today. And it was like, you have had these 10 or so friends die. What would they want you to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm -hmm. You know, trying to look for the emotional talk. Because now he has those friends with him. They just, they just yeah, showed up. Yeah, they showed the up deck. today. That was right. great. So I'm looking to do that. 
because that is uncommon to get that kind of response in a way that's not manipulative and, uh, and not salacious. I don't need salacious. J- Jimmy's interesting just because of who he is. Yeah. You know, I don't need salacious. Uh, Tim Kennedy is a good example of someone who you can go salacious because he'll say provocative shit that I frankly don't agree with. You know, I, yeah, I, you can say words like waterboarding, yeah. opinion given. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. PTSD, ah, oh, you get over that shit. Like, okay, that's great. But, uh, and also, you know, he's, he's, I don't want to unfairly unfairly characterize him, but it's all I can do right now. So um, he is immature in his approach to conflict. It's not all killing. It just can't be. Yeah, you're a Green Beret. Let's be honest with what you guys do. You guys mostly partner with other people. And like all operators, you will have more conversations than you will shoot bullets. So if your answer is bullets and killing, you probably have some evolutions to go through. Yeah. So how does that, how does that use that analogy from, you know, something from that extreme to achieve an effect, whether it's bullets and killing you achieve an objective at is, is the end state for eliminating something to what, how you evolve in what you do now. Does that make sense? Ask me again in another way. Yeah, so how does using that analogy from what you just gave from yeah. you know killing people um, and achieving an objective? How do you how do you get around that to find a different way to achieve your end state? Okay, I'm a big believer, and I've seen this done, and I've used it is is creating an affect over an effect because the affect will yank the effect along with it. You just killed 15 people. Well, let me see how that, what the response to stimuli is, which is the noun version of affect, right? What's the response to stimuli? Well, everybody here is terrified of the S. Like, uh, uh, we use the example all the time in stories where they talk about the police on one side of the river and, the, and on the other side are a special operations guy. They come across and they're snatching guys in the middle of the night. And we're trying to teach Iraqis about due process. And you're snatching motherfuckers out of their bed. They're sleeping. Innocent people are sleeping in trenches. Oh, don't not wanting to get arrested. So now you got men not in their home, terrified for their families. They're sleeping in irrigation ditches, hiding, you know, and it's like none of that. None of that is the desired impact in a place that's trying to become normal. The specter of war is way worse than the reality of it in modern conflict. From my experience, the specter is way worse. Now, there are times like when you guys are in a full pitch battle in Ramadi. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the other places where the conflict is spiky, you know, where it's like, there's war today. Now there's not, there's war today. Now there's not, you know, that kind of thing. And so you can't have that approach. So you, if you don't lead with an effect, if you can't design an effect and figure out if you can create it, then you are only left with effects. And I'll tell you right now, effects fail all the time. So that, I mean, that's, I think the approach that I try to take is how do you, what impact emotionally are you creating? with what you do and it it tempers what I do now. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero, co-host of break it down show and fellow producer here at Lions rock productions. And I'm proud to announce our newest show coming in January. It's called justice. Season one is going to be a deep dive into some of the cases I personally worked on as a licensed private investigator. And you'll get a unique view into the criminal justice system that may just challenge some of your personal notions about how it should work and open your eyes in ways you never imagined. So keep your ears open for Justice, a brand new podcast coming in January from Lions Rock Productions to iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. So that, I mean, that's, I think, the approach that I try to take is how do you, what impact emotionally are you creating with what you do? And it, it tempers what I do now. Yeah, now I'm thinking back uh, of all the interviews we did or that we conducted <laughs> together. Like, how was Pete trying to mind fuck me <laughs> uh, be, using his spy like powers? Uh, I, I don't think I'm sharp enough to figure that out, but uh, that's probably just ego. <laughs> Most of the time, like, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm lost I think in that you probably play on ego a lot too. Like, to, sure, you know, when, when you when you pull those emotional pieces that people connect to not only in in combat which is is, we've talked about that enough Uh, we don't need to bore listeners with that but 
using those emotional pieces, those things that you use, the example, the picture of my Marines on the wall or whatever it is in the setting that you do to pull that emotional response. And a lot of the interviews you do are in person, which we agree are always the best. Yeah. Like today we're interviewing motocross legend, plank owner of the whole industry, almost, you know, Jimmy Fitzpatrick, we're yeah. at, you know, he lives across the street from me, this phenomenal setting. And it's so comfortable when you're in that setting. Cause you can pull those pieces. Cause everyone feels comfortable at home. We're at my home right now. Yeah. And you know, Pete's been here plenty of times, but so talk about when we do, a remote interview when it's a computer screen or skyping or zooming someone in yeah. and how do you, you i mean you read about a person you know a little bit about them we do a lot of research on people sure. before we go into an interview because we want to respect that person we want to, be able, to. yeah you have to respect the person that you're interviewing him and you know understand that their time is so valuable how do you do that remotely what's what are the, what are the things that people that want to do this or even some of the people you've interviewed understand like oh wow Pete was doing this this is how he did that I mean we're looking for those questions that make them go oh wow you know and try to get that different response where they have to actually access their brain or it makes them respond I mean that's I'm looking for a question that's less obvious but but not silly mm-hmm. you know like how do you get this person to think about this and People don't realize what they know in terms of as they say things like, wait, hold on. You just skipped a huge thing. You know, you, you have this incredible experience. What happened five minutes before that? Like, what were you thinking about? And I'm like, like, oh, yeah, you know what? I hadn't thought about that. And then you get these incredible stories. Like we just did and just posted uh, Andrew Bernstein. And he was talking about how he was a Brooklyn Jewish kid going to UMass, taking pictures for the sports paper, and he ends up becoming a photographer. He's like, but I was fooling around. I was just doing stuff. We had a, a daily paper, so I'm taking pictures. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was I'm doing it, but that was it. And so he's like, I have to do something else. So, you know, I started going to Pasadena Academy of Art, or whatever the school was called, but it's Pasadena. And I'm like, stop. How's a Jewish kid from Brooklyn end up in Pasadena at an art school? That doesn't just happen. And he's like, Oh, my sister is a DD Khan. She was Frenchy in Greece, <laughs> you know? And so you end up in this totally different place by getting him to slow down and go, Oh, that is a big thing. That is a big, huge leap. So you, not granted that was face to face, but that, I'm looking for those moments in a conversation where you can grab someone and just turn that conversation around to a different spot where you can, you th- get them thinking yeah. about it. So it's easier when you're face to face. I think that's unique to you as a, huh. as an interviewer that, I, you you don't go out with the with the aim of trying to pull those things. You you go into an interview and those things just kind of drop into your lap, and you have the intuition to understand. Like, hold on a second, let's let's spin the wheel on that a little bit. How gratifying is that? Also, to know that you've really brought some illumination to the person you're interviewing that they never would have thought of in a million years. Like, God, I never took the time to stop and think about the process on how I got here. Because most people think about the end state. Mm -hmm. I'm guilty of that. I mean, completely because you know this, I I think I get, here's the true confession for this interview, which I love (laughs) giving is, is, and I told you this already is I'm an emotional person. I have come to grips with that. Like a lot of the, the things I do in life, a lot of the, the the decisions I make are emotionally based, and that's just the person I am, and you kind of evolve into that. And I think not only talking to you and our friendship has is, is, is evolved, although it seemed like 10 years, yeah. uh, 20, whatever, is you know, you realize these things as you go along, but when you have that opportunity to make a person stop and say, man, I never really realized about what it took me to get here. What's that like for you yeah. as an interviewer? Yeah, it's it's incredible. Uh, um, Andrew, again, when he went to, out to New York to visit his sister while she was making grease, he said he had an epiphany. Well, it, that's a big life-changing moment. We're not going past that. Like, stop. Let's get into that moment. And then one of the things that I've picked up is is my 
my interaction, what I'm feeling and where I'm drawing these things from, and my ego. Like there's all kinds of times when I want to ask, oh, I want to ask this question, but I've, I've learned to shut up more and really save those questions or stories for, for when I want to do something with them, you know? And it's hard. It's, it takes a lot of discipline because I always want to butt in. I always want to, you know, do it. Oh, and then I, this happened. And a lot of stuff that, a lot of that stuff does creep out. But um, I'm a lot more emotional about a lot more things now as I've shared these incredible things with people. You know, and when Shaka and I are talking and I talk about getting off the X and how like how critical that is for us. We're always looking for the X so we can not even get on it. And then once we're on it, doing everything we can to get off. And he's like, there's X's everywhere in the hood. Like, yeah, I, I bet. And they're not easily marked. And then you think about that. And I, I feel so bad. Not badly, but I feel the weight of that conversation. And even right now, it makes me emotional, you know, when I think about that. Or I think about um, our friend uh, across the way who's got this diagnosis and the world that he's in. And, like, the first thing these guys think of is, is how do I help the next person in line? Yeah. How do I start a foundation and start raising money? for Probably not for me, you know, but for five guys from now. That's, like, the first thing they think of. And it's such a beautiful thing, and it makes me emotional like I've never been before because you you experience this in real time. See, you base your profession off of talking and asking questions. So I'll just ask you kind of an open-ended question. This is kind of (laughs) rather-esque. I love it. Listening. Yeah, well, I'm guilty of not always listening. You know, you can be really good at listening, so good at interviewing that you don't have to listen all the time. And I know what the next simple question is, and I miss the golden questions because I'm in tweeting. I'm not fully present. I mean, you know, and that's, I'll allow myself that those are advanced level interview skills to be that present all the time and to not be distracted. I've tried to do less of the social media stuff during, but then I will absolutely forget about the camera, you know? So my monitor, I've had to turn it more towards that listening thing. It's a challenge. And then also ignoring my ego at the same time while I listen, cause I get all pat and then my ego is talking to me and that's distracting me from listening. Cause there's real important words in there. Um, but that's, yeah, that's my answer to listening. The listening question is it's, very hard to do at the level that I want to do it at. Doesn't mean I'm not listening. I don't want to say that, but there are times when I certainly could listen more. And then I, when I, and here's why I know when I edit the shows, cause I edit all the shows. I'm like, I don't even remember him saying this. I miss these, these key questions. You know, the interview's still great. You guys would never know, but I know. So yeah, that's my answer to listen. the obvious follow question. That would be regrets <laughs> on editing <laughs> on editing, but we won't go there. That's an inside rather yeah. esoteric discussion. But so, but on in the same vein. So what, what is the golden question? Like, what does that look like to you? It's unknown. You have to be prepared for it. And that means you have to have several things. Like when I, would do combat questions, right? I would have a number of magazines of questions, farmer questions, you know, basic PIR information request questions, you know, all these different things. And you're, so you're ready with the right question system and conversation. So that means a lot of out loud, crazy person walking around the camp conversations, you know, where I'm like, well, then I would want to say this. And, you know, and I backwards playing these conversations out. That level of detail is not required with what we do here. That level of detail is required because I'm not going to go out with you and your company and be fucking around for one second. I'm going to be as prepared as I can be. And there'll be no doubt that like Pete's ready every single time. Different world though. So here, when it comes to that, I don't know, the, uh, the art of asking questions in this case is different. I'm kind of off topic now. But the questions that I want to ask come from my experience for sure in thousands of interviews. You know, so there's questions, but those golden things, they're obvious to me when I see them and I'm like, oh, this is epiphany. Stop. No one knows about this. And if they, if they do, if they do know that epiphany story, cause he's told that 
I can get a lot more detail out of that. If so what is it that you think that most listeners, you, you, you could even relate this to back. And again, we don't, I don't want to go down this, 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 this avenue about, about combat, but you can relate to like the type of questions you pull out to give the commander this. So at this stage where we're here now, mm-hmm. what is it that you really want to pull out that you want to share with people, you know, the listeners well, I mean, uncommon things, right? So, what's uncommon to you? Well, that's let me, what, yeah. <laughs> let me let me not subscribe to the Pete Turner. Like, wait, wait, wait for it, because I've been getting coach great coaching from Pete on interview skills, which is hugely applicable to what I do sure. as a writer. And just waiting for the answer instead of interrupting and being a chatterbox so that I'm prone to be and being a better listener. But what is that? Well, there's a couple things. One. Uh, that whole thing with fear, right? Like having my ego be subordinate to the conversation. That's conquering fear. The not worrying about the fear of silence, letting that become comfortable. That's a miscomfort. Like I need to be comfortable with silence. So all of these things feed into that. I also have to be comfortable that I don't always know what's gold. Someone else is going to go, holy shit. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Jason McEnroth, he's is basically as old as us. Uh, probably show number three, no more than show number six. Early on, he played drums with, with Henry Rollins and, and was a professional drummer for years in Blue Man Group. And he passed on. Uh, he had uh, prostate cancer. But in the last, I think, month maybe even, one of his sons who were like right at, joined the Army age and one was younger a couple of years, you know, five, five years ago. But now they're men, right? And like, hey, I found this show. I didn't even know it existed. And it's my dad talking. Like one of the last things he mm-hmm. ever did publicly, you know. And I can't. I didn't know that gold was there. Man, it, that's that. You know, we were talking before the show about about great interviewers, and we were talking about the Kenny Rogers interview with Dan Rather, and the pointy question he asked him about his kids. And to think about that really just made me pause and think about what I do. And I think in this day and age of social media, I mean, the thousands of things I've posted, the hundreds of interviews that I've done that my daughter in, in my absence would be able to click and listen back in and get some real introspection or is that the right word introspection introspective I think, I think, introspective I, you know as a writer my vocabulary should be much better but, <laughs> that's what editors uh, are for. yeah that may be the uh multiple interviews i've done today regardless to, to have that ability to like there's a library of information about your dad yeah. or about your mom or someone you were friends with yeah. And he said, oh, man, I never, ever heard them say that. And this guy, Pete Turner, right, from Benicia, California, yeah, got them to say this. And throughout my whole life, I never heard them say that. Like, have you ever thought about that? Yeah, I, I, I do think about I that. I mean, the second and third order effects, Pete. All right, that's exactly what we're talking about. So, so yeah, this is gold. I know this is gold, and this will always be interesting. But this other question where they say something or, you know, I spark some memory in them and they, they just go off on a tangent about the thing, I, you know, it's part of the show. It's part of what that moment is. It, that's why I like the beauty of the conversation over necessarily the interview where it's kind of like you kind of walk that line. It's a it's a conversation. It's a wonderful conversation. And you want people to lean in and go. Oh, it's fascinating. You I think know? what's cool about that is. For anyone listening to this episode is that we, we've talked about you know, who we get on the show, who we interview, how we elicit questions, but the the subtext of that and the, the again those second and third order effects that we're we're creating something here that is just it's out there forever in this day and age. The yeah. te- you can't you can't forget about this technological age that we live in and the fact that 
although you may not be writing a volume of a book that goes on a shelf that can come and go, this thing called the internet that the kids are all talking about, <laughs> it's not a fad, people. <laughs> this yeah. thing is here, and it yeah. is here to stay. It's only going to continue to grow. And these small pieces, these small 50, 60-minute episodes that people share of their lives is there for everyone to listen to forever. Yeah. I don't think it's ever going to go away. I don't think so either. And when I think about the time that I would spend, and there's nothing wrong with watching TV, but the time that I've spent my life doing that, or I might be, if I would have spent half that time doing something more productive, and again, nothing wrong with that, but... If you've seen Cheers, you've seen every episode of Big Bang Theory. If you've seen every episode of Big Bang Theory, you've seen every episode of Friends. You know, like the jokes are the same. Yeah. The stories are the same. And a lot of that's true about these conversations, but there's so much more context and dynamicism in these conversations. Well, think about that in the grand scheme of things as far as those people who are committed to entertaining or telling stories or reporting news or being a journalist is how differently their minds are geared on what their priorities are. And the other vast segment of the public who love to watch every single episode of this, every yeah. single, they binge watch this, Netflix this, th that's how they consume, that's how they process their life or that's how they balance their life with the job yeah. they have, what they want to do, what they never got to do. And I think some people who are in a unique position, and I feel very fortunate to be in this position that we can eliminate those. I, I just call them distractions at this yeah. point of my life where I, I'm lucky if I watch a couple cool shows that I maybe DVR yeah. or Netflix and that's my entertainment to just kind of disconnect. But my real passion is connecting to those people in those shows or those people that watch those shows or contribute yeah. and how it affects them. That's, that's the story again, to use that word subtext again, is th those are the stories that really, I think, are the most important to engage people. What, yeah. what do you think about that? Uh, well, I was when you were saying that, I wasn't listening. <laughs> no, I was. I was. The but golden I was... <laughs> question escaped Pete. <laughs> but I was thinking about um, <laughs> when you said that. You made me think about a guy I met yesterday. We had coffee, and you know, if someone invites you to coffee, I'm going to say yeah. You're like, yeah, of course. It's a veteran. You know, as an officer, and, and he's getting a PhD, and he was talking about some guru in his part of the uh, PhD world, and uh, he's like, you know, I'd love to be on the show, and I'm like, well, of course, of course, we'll have you on the show. Like, you have something to say, you know, you're interesting, and uh, he's like, well, have you read this guy's book? And I'm like, no, but let's just get him on the show, and it blew his mind. Like the Air Force officer, retired guy's like, wait, we can get this huge guru? And I'm like, of course, of course, and if not him, there's five like him from that field. One of those people is going to say yes and and open a door where you get to have a conversation. So now not only are you reading the book, but you're applying real-time interaction to this person that you find wonderful, you know? So, yeah, I don't need distractions. Granted, I, I watch Survivor, which is kind of a human interaction show. Um, and is that I love, show still on? Yeah, and I love the editing. I love the editing. No idea that show is still on. Yeah, yeah. It's my, what it's, season is it? I don't even keep track. <laughs> like I just forty five. Yeah, it's something that crazy. Uh, that my lady and I do together. My lady, mm -hmm. and Renaissance man. That's right, my lady. <laughs> and we also, on occasion, she and I will watch TV together. But it's less about distraction, more about timed interaction. You know, even though it's kind of a, you know, we'll talk about the show for days afterwards. But yeah, that ability to take that person in real life and really put them down in front of you and, and have a conversation. And then to take them and put them into an environment where uh, I love what we did with uh, Michelle Rigby Assad. You know, field spy, CIA spy, field commander. And then talking about, you know, the... I don't know, the virtual her that would be on your shoulder. And you're like, I just have to trust that that virtual CIA person who I don't know exists, this, this information's good. And I'm going to put my, my dudes in harm's way based on that. And she, she's thinking, you know, the virtual Scott on her shoulder, she's like, I owe this guy the best that I've got. 
Yeah. Oh, it's such a great conversation. Yeah, that was something too. Again, through our, that just really fell into our lap. That that show with uh, Michelle, where you know not only is she uh, you know wrote a great book and she had all this life experience, she's still doing it to this day, but it really exposed itself during that episode of the connection that we had. Again, it was kind of a almost like we were pen pals yeah. in a combat environment yes. where I, I I was sending this type of information. It was being received and it was heard and I was getting a response, but I didn't really know the person that it was coming from. Right. Yeah, that that is really where you know you invite people on the show and the, these magical things, not to sound too Disneyland, but they do happen. Yeah. It, it, it's really something that is extraordinary that comes out of doing a show like this. So, um, I, I, I'd have to say, um, I don't know, to to shift gears. Yeah. Um, interviews that you want to do in the next hundred episodes, people, stories that you want to grab. So there, there are so many, but there's one I'm really excited about, and it's booked, and John's going to do it, and I think John's perfect for it. It's this guy named, his rap name is X-Rated, um, and that's what you have to look at, x raid like I'm going to raid the compound, X-Rated. And he, he and some friends killed some people. They went to jail for murder, and you know he says he didn't do it, but the 40-something-year-old him has been in jail for 20-plus years says, I didn't do the killing but I went there to harm those people and I deserve my time in jail. So you've got this culpable guy who's also an artist and he's been rapping the entire time that he's been in prison, putting his raps over the prison payphone to his friend. They record it and put out an album and he's a signed act. Wow. Yeah. So this guy's, you know, there's, I have to know about this guy. I have to understand who and he's out now. Right. And he's, he's out, but he's, Limited travel cannot go to the area where he killed the people because that's just we don't do that. So and I don't mean you don't do that and like you don't you know like you shouldn't like he's not allowed like you're staying in this area where he lives and that's where you stay until we get more comfortable with you being out and about. So having this person talk about the entire process of all of it, you know. I, I'm really looking forward to that conversation and John's going to kill it. It's perfect for him. You know, he'll, he'll really pull out a great show and, 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 you know, some people talk to him, but they go for the sensational part. There's so much more interesting stuff with that guy. You know, what about, uh, all the high viz people that you haven't gotten on the show? Do you re-engage with those people or you just kind of leave them in the wake? No, no, it's my job to be persistent. You know, I mean, I know not everybody does that, but my job is to like, I want you, I want you on the show. I'm not kidding. Like I really do. I'll just, I'll be back, you know? And, and when we like, I I want Tom Hanks. Um, I haven't figured out a good bridge to him directly, but once he comes on, it'll be so natural and easy. He'll be like, yeah, I don't know why we didn't do this a long time ago. You know? So um, you either have time to build the bridge or you don't, you don't really control that. So I'm just going to keep on doing it, but I would love to have, you know, Tom Hanks and there's a bunch of musicians we're about to get that, you know, we're super close to getting Jimmy jam and there's nobody bigger in music than Jimmy jam, you know? So when we talk about names, we don't always get all of them, but we always get people that are incredible and they all know each other. So you just build a network and the next thing. Yeah. I think we were talking about before the show too. one of the things, both you and I are, I guess guilty of is follow up how we get so consumed with the multitude of requests that we have, the the, the people that ask us for things and and beg of our time and you try and prioritize and you want to answer everything and we don't write those things down and we we're bad at this. And I mean, we've, we've talked so many times about, Oh, we're going to get this person on the show. We're going to get this. Uh I think one of them was, uh, Coolio. Yeah. And uh, I, I shared that great story with you. Yeah. Like I was a lieutenant in 29 Palms. It's I went so to Big awesome. Bear and I'm skiing and I had bologna sandwiches with Coolio at his stretched out Suburban that said Coolio.com on it. I'm like, this guy is a veteran. 
surely he'll want to come on the show. We put the request out, but I've never done the follow up. Yeah. I think I did a follow up, but it, I didn't hear anything back. So Coolio, if you're listening, we want you on the Break It Down show, yeah. and uh, it's going to be great. But yeah, it's really tough uh, to manage your time and yeah. to follow up. So uh, I think that uh, most people that are probably listening don't understand too that. You've got wants uh, that not not only I think f- for you and and for me it's you you really want to grab these stories, but you also struggle with the fact that is it is it attainable? Yeah, I mean, do you ever do you ever feel like this is just not going to happen? We have a bridge to Rob Lowe. When Rob Lowe is ready to talk about something, he pretty will. Rob Lowe, yeah, pretty Rob Lowe, exactly. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And he'll do national level media because that's what he knows. And I'm positive that if if he's in a mood to talk, you know, we're we are something like that he would come talk to, you know. So maybe I need three different people leaning on him saying, "Oh yeah, Pete's a good guy." So I don't think it's impossible to get almost anybody as long as they're willing to talk. I mean, if the person's just not going to talk to anybody, then you know, like the guy who writes Game of Thrones. I've tried to reach out to that guy. He just doesn't want to talk to anybody. So, but but that's fine. You know, I'll still send a thing every now and then. You know, and and me, it'll work out or it won't. You know. Yeah. Well, I see that's something that just came to light too. Is uh, uh, a good friend of mine who saw my daughter being born while I was in Baghdad. Uh-huh. She is a amazing person, Karen Walsh. Love you, Karen. Love Karen. Uh, I'll send you this episode so you get a shout out. She went to college with Pete Dinklage. Yeah. And I guess she still like has, you know, some correspondence with him maybe, but like, yeah. you know, it, it's this 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 type of connection. It's you know, what we call in the military combined arms. Yes. We're going to provide some indirect fire, we're going to keep yeah. their heads down, and yeah. then we're going to send some machine gun fire, uh-huh. and they can make a decision. Yeah. They can either run away from the bombs dropping on their head and yeah. expose themselves or be shot down by the machine gun fire. But one way or the other, you're going to make contact. I've got intersecting fields of fire. Yes. And also join ops, too, because I'll take <laughs> like uh, Wes Maybe, who lives in London and is a, a music producer slash engineer, and he'll say, oh, you know what? I want to have so-and-so on the show. Okay, let's do it. Let's book him. I yeah. told you, like, just book him. And uh, same thing with this Andrew Bernstein guy. He gets all these legends from sports. He's had Kareem on his show. He's had Nolan Ryan on his show. And like, but yeah, when you have someone in your life who doesn't fit that mold, you should bring him on my show. And he's like, I'd never thought about yeah. that. So who who who's going to be on this show next hundred episodes? Who's like your top ten lineup that uh, well, I people, hope we get people can tune into and, yeah. and say, hey man, the Break It Down show. I got to put that. I got to save that as a as a favorite on my uh, my uh, my iPhone. I got to put that as a book, the next bookmark on my hundred computer. Shows, it's uh, well, so the next hundred shows. Okay, I'm hoping that we get Didi Khan because how great would that be to talk to her about being on Greece and then barely talk about that again and talk about what it's like to be you know an actress in Hollywood for the last 40 years. She was on 72 different episodes of Benson. You know, so she's got a career outside of Greece so surely she wants to talk about that. But that would be incredible. Um I would love to get David Foster. He's we're close enough to start to ask now. But he's a very busy dude. That's the other thing. Is you have to respect how busy these guys are. And then twice now, we've almost had Danny Trejo. It just hasn't worked out because he's super busy. And, you know, I want to sit in a room with Danny Trejo and talk to him. I don't want to talk to him on the phone like it's a 15-minute phone or for the radio. Mm-hmm. That doesn't do anybody any good. You know, yeah. like this, that's that format. That's not this format. I think uh, you've done radio shows. I've done a couple hundred radio shows in the last year. Yeah. It is a really different dynamic, too, because when you go into that type of forum, you got to get your message out in seven minute segments, if that. If that. If that. Yeah. And I I think some listeners love that type of, you know, pizzicato. Yeah. They want information in and out, in and out. And then there's others that really are tuned into this podcast medium that is taking over. Yeah. It's only going to get better and you're only going to get bigger and under really getting underneath the skin, really taking that and scraping beneath the surface to get people to share what they hadn't thought of beyond 
getting their message out, you know, yeah. in seven minutes because you just can't do that. Yeah. It, and, and that's where people battle <laughs> when you're selling a product, you're selling your brand, you're yeah. selling your movie, you're selling this is like, I need to capitalize on this because this is my business. If I don't talk about this in seven minutes, I'm wasting valuable yeah. airtime. And that's a decision that people have to make. I could have gone off on many tangents and talked about the emotional things and some esoteric things about what was important about writing my story and yeah. sharing this and doing that. But what was important was this. And and there's also responsibilities you have to other people, like your publisher, yeah. your producer. So I think that that's, that's an interesting thing. And, in and the those interviews also tend to get canned where you're like, this is the interview I'm doing. This is my seven minute pitch, you know? And so not all the time for everybody, but if you're on a press tour and you're doing my Huckabee, you know, this person that you're going to say the same things a lot. Oh, it's it's ridiculous. Um, I I remember when when we launched the book, uh, when we launched Echo and Ramadi on Fox and Friends with Kilmead, and my publicist, she just black. My Google Calendar looked like it had been hit with a twelve gauge shotgun with birdshot. It was yeah. nuts, and I was literally locked in my hotel room in New York City, doing back to back interviews. There was at least 20, 25 interviews. It yeah. was insane. And there were all these seven minute sound bites. And if it was good enough, they'd say, Hey, can you hold on the line and do another one? And you'd have to say, no, I can't yeah. because I got to jump I'm on this so other good. show, man. Yeah. And you feel bad because you want to elaborate. You yeah. want to tell a story, but it's, it's really something, you know, that, you have, that you don't prepare uh, yourself for. The other thing about all of that is like, you tell the story of, of, uh, of, of, of Libby. And how impactful his passing is in the story. And you guys open basically with that. Like you guys, you open with that in the book. Basically, like this happens fast. And in the next segment, holiday gift guide. <laughs> like, wait a second. Yeah. We we just covered this kid's death, and I'm almost in tears. And it, it doesn't. This doesn't work, right? Like you have to like. You know, you and I could explore this in an hour long and talk about, you know, the time you guys went out for sh secret shots because the commander could never be. But, you know, and I'm just making these things up, but you could have a whole a whole story of why this guy was so important to everybody because you've talked to everybody about it. And there's no holiday gift guide segment seven minutes later. To yeah, totally I think there, I think there's a place for that in that's going to be sustained uh, in what we used to call terrestrial radio, which in and of itself has has morphed into you know podcasts. It's it, you can restream it, you can listen to it again. It's on demand, yeah. uh, whatever the medium is, it's there. But when you want to click on a certain topic to learn about a certain person or you want to learn about a certain story or a certain piece of history, you're going to click that button and you're going to tune into the Break It Down show yeah. and listen to Pete Turner talk to, gratuitous plug, Sebastian Younger. Oh, nice. There He's got to get a plug in every show we do. <laughs> that guy is legendary. We love Sebastian. Just to be connected to that guy because, you know, we think it, we, we love his work he he's so instrumental in sharing great stories and and what he does but people want to click on that they want to go to the break it down show they want to go to pop it, pop the bubble and they want to understand the full story and you may be only capable of listening to 7 minutes of one segment but you got a meeting mm -hmm. or you got to get out of your car but you know you can come back to that yeah. and that's what's so powerful about this podcast is that it's always going to be there. It's always there. And then, you know, my, it's my job to always put someone in front of you who you didn't realize you wanted to know more about. And then hopefully, you know, I don't think Sebastian realizes how seriously I took that tasking of gathering people in the middle, you know, like help us out. Like I want to put, we've had people that are extremely left leaning and I don't, I purposely avoid certain political things when I talk. I'm not afraid of politics, but I don't want to. I don't want to highlight a person because they're left leaning or because they're right leaning. I, I want to highlight them because they're incredible. Yeah. And I'm hoping that that makes people go, "Oh, well, that guy didn't talk about how he loves or hates Donald Trump." Because it's not about Donald Trump anyhow. 
That's about life, you know. If you're worried about Donald Trump, go hug your kid. You know, go go do something else with that time. I'm begging you, take your <laughs> special someone to the opera and watch incredible people at world class performers perform for you. And do that and take your special someone. I'm begging you to do that instead of go see Donald Trump. I mean just you know, on TV. How, again, how again. important it is to gain that perspective. How important is it to you? as you gain experience and you're so inundated by different people of different talents of different backgrounds to expose yourself to those different types of mediums. Like you were just posting you and the your lady <laughs> went to the opera and to, to experience that. And I, I think really the question I'm getting at is if Pete Turner had to tell the listeners what to do better to make your lives better yeah. on this episode. What, what are those things? Yeah. Worry about less stuff that you can't control. I mean, tend to your own fucking grass, you know, quit looking at my grass, <laughs> quit looking at anybody, get some goddamn business. Pete's lawn sucks by yeah. the way, but <laughs> it, does he ha- suck. it sucks bad, yeah. but he's yeah. got pomegranates. That's right. You got, citrus lemons are coming in right now <laughs> yeah it's lovely yeah 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 so but, but i mean that's the biggest thing like if you're <laughs> so involved and in, if you know so much about the Mueller case you're either stoked or sad I, I would i would suggest you invest that time into something that lifts you up mm. i would it's spend that time with people that you love we all take the like i don't want to take things for granted we all have things that we can't even help but take for granted you know there's electricity in the house You know how rare that is in most of the rest of the world. I mean, come on. At any point in time, fresh water everywhere. You know, just so many things. So take out the people in your life that you are already taking for granted. We all do. it. I take my mom for granted all the time. My brother, too. You know, and spend more time with those folks because that's infinitely more important. Infinitely more important, you know, than than doing that. You've got friends you haven't seen enough. Go see them. Go out to lunch. Go take him out to dinner. Get out of the house for 25 minutes. Don't watch TV and just go have a chat with your with your person that you love. That, that's what I would say. Just just more interaction with each other and, and less uh, less thumbs on screens and less hate on the TV. Because that's what a lot of those TV shows sell is hate. Yeah. It's, it, it is a real challenge uh, to break away from social media, to break away from the TV and really interact with people. I think uh, I'm. I suffer from it. Uh, there's there's an absolute creeping addiction yeah. to think I haven't been on here. I haven't given followers this. I have a responsibility to do this and to appropriately manage your time for what's important in life. Yeah. And I think that is really probably the most prophetic thing that you could have said during this episode. I think we're all guilty of it, right? Like you and I are in a social media world where it's part of our trade, you know, and, and uh, you have to do it to some extent, but yeah, you have to. I think that's, I think that's really cool in the fact that one of the things listeners may not understand about you as a person, as a podcaster talking about, being sucked into that social media world, that 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 virtual world that most people live in, or you see them on the train in their phone, they won't look at people on the bus or in a lobby, is that you take the time to drive around the state of California, out of the state of California, to conduct these interviews in person. I think that that is really important because you have to extricate yourself from your comfort zone and understand that I got to do this. I I feel safe here. I feel comfortable. I'm insulated, but you force yourself to leave and get out and really interact with people. And then every time you say, Oh, I don't want to do this, but you force yourself to do it. The, the, the product becomes better just like today with Jimmy yeah. on the dock and, and being there and connecting with people and seeing the environments they live in, that's power. Yeah. That's real power. It is. 
It is. What have you picked up from these uh, the shows that you've done? You've done quite a few. I don't even know the number anymore. You've yeah, so Pete's many. turning the table on me now. Uh, what have I picked up on this is the most important thing I've probably learned is the value of friendship. Yeah. Uh, to be quite honest and not to get too emotional and teary eyed, but uh, to really look back and think that uh, our friendship over this last year, which seems so much longer, right. has evolved so quickly that I, I love it that we call each other, we communicate, we, we were involved in projects together. And I think it's all based off of a common goal to share great stories and to really spread that to so many people that, that don't have exposure to yeah. some of the really unique facets of different people's lives that we're so very fortunate to be invited into. Yeah. I mean, I think that is one of the most remarkable things that we're allowed to come to people's homes and ask them strange questions, put them on the spot, and then they give us answers. Yeah. And we can promote it and share that with total strangers. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of people whom we've never met is just... Uh, people in other countries. Yeah. Other countries. This is, this is international yeah. where you're really making a difference and shedding light on so many great topics so many great people that they never would have had the opportunity to see and i think that you're sitting in your living room you're watching a tv show and you see this celebrity or you see this public figure or you see this phd this professor and you think man i'd really like to get to know more about him but you have that opportunity if you yeah. tune into the break it down show or pop in the buffle I mean, you're going to, you're going to get that. I, I think that's, that's what I've gained from this. Uh, not, not just the involvement in the, in the project of what you do, but the friendship that you and I have cultivated and sustained. Yeah. I, I think it takes work. It does. It, I mean, we both have really demanding schedules yeah. and we always answer the phone normally yeah. uh, when we're not on the phone with someone else. <laughs> Which is we always, always return calls. Yeah. We rarely leave voicemail messages. And yeah. I think that that's something that I like into being a kid again. Like yeah. you've got a guy that you're connected to where you can just stop over and say, hey, you want to hang out? Yeah, let's hang out. There's no... Hey, let's schedule a phone call for 3 p.m. on Thursday. I've got 15 minutes. There's none of that shit. It's yeah. always accessible, and I, I respect that, and I, I value that. Same. Same. That's good stuff. What do we do here? Are we doing all right? <clears throat> awesome. Thanks for doing episode 400 with me. Yeah, I that tell you, good. the uh, centennial episodes, man, I'm privileged to be a part of uh, I, I, uh my my only it to Dan rather you. My huh? only regret is that we didn't meet sooner. Well, that's fine. We got plenty of time we left. We do. Yeah. No, I love him. Yeah.